right, so turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. So uh, Sunday, Pastor Kevin, he said, hey, we're in Ezekiel, and Devon, I would just love it if you would talk about something that has to do with prophecy or something that goes along the same kind of lines, the same kind of feel as, as, as what we're doing on Wednesday. So I love talking about the rapture and the day of the Lord, right? I love it. I, get, I, mean, I got goosebumps right now talking about it. And so I said, you know, it's a Wednesday. Sometimes the middle of the week is tough, right? And you, just, you can just barely get here. So why not have a little fun? Let's talk about the rapture. Let's talk about the day of the Lord. I promise you won't agree with everything. That's kind of the point. I love it, right? If you don't agree, I don't want to talk to you about it afterwards. I want you to go read your Bible and figure it out. You don't have to trust me, but I want to make you think today, okay? Um, I want to encourage you. I want to give you guys confidence, right? But most importantly, I want you to leave just feeling a little bit closer to the Lord. If we get that, it's a great day, right? Amen? Amen. All right. So are we all there? Say amen. Amen. All right. Verse 13, it says, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring him with those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So we'll start there. All right. So uh, verse 13, it says, but I do not want you to be ignorant and... Uh, ignorant means lacking knowledge or awareness in general, uneducated or unsophisticated. At least that's what Google says it means. So I want to, a lot of times these verses only get read at funerals. And I think that's out of place. And I got to thinking about my own life and I said, well, you know, when did I first like visit Thessalonians, this section? And I started to think about um, my grandfather. Who in here has seen The Lion King? Like the, the, like the old school Lion King, not the new one, like the cartoon. So there's a scene in there where, where, where uh, Simba, right? He's like, we're best friends, Dad, right? We'll always be together. And <clears throat> me and my grandfather would have moments like that. And in those moments, he would take that time and he says, I'm like 50 years older than you, buddy. We're friends, but we won't always be together. And we would talk about the circumstances of the rapture, if he died, what to look forward to, to the point where I was so excited when my grandfather passed, I may have shared like one or two tears. It was all excitement. He used to tell me, say, buddy, if I go before you, understand it's a good thing. And we'll meet together at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And if Jesus... If Jesus lets me, I'll fix your plate. I want everybody to have that hope because we're different. Right? I remember sitting in this funeral and people said, well, you guys are close. How are you holding up? And I said, man, I'm fantastic. I can barely stand it. Oh, I didn't mean to get up here and get emotional on you, but that's the point. We should not sorrow like those who have no hope. Right? When my grandfather passed, it was, it was awesome. Right? I was like, Papa, you made it. I can't wait to see you. And I still believe that today. And what's, what's really cool is that now I have the opportunity. My daughter, she rides in the car with me. She says, Dad, we're friends, right? And I'm like, we're friends. <laughs> and we'll always be together. And I say, well, sweetie, let me talk to you about that. And we just pass it along one generation to the next until he comes. And that's comfort. So verse 14, got to get off of that. <laughs> Four. I love this verse too. I mean, every, I mean, this thing is just full of nuggets. It says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So I think there's 
There's a couple of points here. The one point that I think is really important that might get overlooked, you have a little bit of an if-then statement there, right? I don't know if you pick it up, but it says, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will, right? And so that first part, right, Jesus died and rose again, we call that the gospel, right? If somebody said, do you believe in the gospel, you would automatically say yes, and they say, well, what did Jesus do for you? And then you would be a very poor Christian if you did not say he died and rose again for me, right? I would challenge you to add the rest of the statement, right? He says, if, even so, right? So when people ask me what Jesus did for me, I said, yes, he died and he rose again. And he's coming back. He's coming back with my grandfather, right? And I 100% I, I believe that, but as Christians, we only talk about, I mean, it's kind of, we only give him like half the story. It's a great opportunity for questions. Well, what do you mean he's coming back? Who told you that? Where do you find that? Right? But we miss a step because we've been programmed. We've not read our Bibles. So God will bring them back. So even so, how comforted, comforting is it to know that our loved ones are with him? Right? I mean, this, is, this has been the year, or I guess several years of madness, right? And people have lost, in general, folks that are close to them. I want to read this to you from uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 6, if you're taking notes. It says, so we are also confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. All right. I'm not seeing Jesus every day. Like, I don't touch him. We are confident, yes, well, please rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And we hear that all the time too, right? Again, at, at, at funerals, you hear it, absent from the body, present for the Lord. But I want you to understand the type of confidence that Paul is having. He's saying, just as you can physically see yourself in this body, in this world, and you don't see Christ, you can have that same confidence as if you could see it, that when you leave, you will be with the Lord. And that, that, what, what that should do is that should bring your confidence level up a notch, right? Because there's, there's no, I, I don't lose ever, right? I cannot lose because it's not about me, right? It's about Christ and my security in him. And, he, and he's saying, look, just as I can see Chris, Terry, I, I can see you. I know that my loved ones are taken care of. And, and, and that does another thing that gets overlooked. It talks about his character, right? God's character is strong enough that he's going to take care of each and every one of us. He won't let none of us go at all for a moment. And that's really what we're talking about. So when you talk about the, the rapture, you talk about the day of the Lord, and we'll get into that here in a few minutes, you really got to understand that you're talking about God's character. And for me, when I read the Bible, just in general, this is not in my notes or anything like that, but when I read the Bible, if something's gray, I try to take it literal, right? But if there's two literal things and I really don't know, I usually choose the one that glorify God the most. Like whichever one makes him sound like the best. Sometimes I could be wrong, I get it, right? But I'm going to choose on the era thinking that my God is dominant and loving and holy, right? And if I'm wrong, he can tell me when I get up there, right? But I'm probably right, just letting you know. So anyway, verse 15, and I say that not to be cocky, by the way, I say that because he is those things. That's why, that's why, that's why, that's why I put my money on those bets because the odds are, in, I have an unfair advantage. God is holy. So if I assume he's holy, I'm likely to be right almost every time, right? When I'm wrong is usually I, I did not understand the question or the text says something in the body of work that I got some context and all that does is make him more holy because it's awesome. I just get to search more and more and more. So just to clear that up. So verse 15, it says, for we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Um, so in my notes I have by the word of the Lord, right? You don't see that very often from Paul, I don't think, right? But you see it often from the prophets, right? Thus says the Lord. And anybody ever came up to you and said, thus said the Lord, you would pay attention, wouldn't you? Right? That is not normal. Right? And when, when they say it, you want to know what he's, what he's got to say. It's important. 
right? This is not something that is superficial or is just not part of our Christian culture or whatever you want to call it. It's, it's, it's a main topic. I would take it just as serious as you would take Elijah, Daniel, Ezekiel, right? We're reading Ezekiel, and every time he says, thus says the Lord, or this is the Lord of the word, we're like, what is he saying? What does that mean, right? And then you get over here, and Paul says, thus says the Lord, and you're like, well, maybe, maybe we get raptured. I, I don't, I may not know, right? It's the same. God's word is, it has the same potency. Verse 16, it says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Couple points. I love it that he does it himself, right? He went to the cross himself, right? He sent prophets, right? Um, Gabriel to talk about stuff. But when it comes down to doing the business, he does it himself. And that is so important. Um, I also love the scene. And when you think about the scene of the rapture and you see the shout, right? I'm not going to shout here, but it's almost like a victory cry. This scene, and you really have to, like, to understand, and you guys do it for yourself, use your own imagination, but you really need to picture this victory call, right? So he comes with the shout, right? He's not timid. It's the voice of an archangel, right? We just got finished talking about Ezekiel, right? Roaring thunder and waves and sounds like an airplane next to you, right? And then he has the trumpet, which is a symbol of just pure victory, right? And I always like to think, you know, from our perspective, it's, it's a little bit crazy because... Like, what's that going to look like? You know, you see the Lord, you see the dead in Christ rise, right? That's going to be a glorious scene. And maybe, just maybe, we might be the generation to see it. And that's comforting, right? I'm excited. That makes you want to get up and tighten up, right? You want to get up and be right. But you, you're looking like, man, is, could it be? Could it be today? And that's what, that's what we're supposed to be looking for because he himself will be coming for us. The, but the contrast is also true. Um, that's, it might be a bad day in general for everybody else. But I don't care. <laughs> right? Because I love the Lord and I want to be with them and it doesn't matter. I'm going to tell everybody I know about Jesus today because I don't know. But if they said you have the option of a billion bucks or you can spend a half an hour with the Lord, I'm like, bah, I got to go. Right? We got to leave now. Let's go. So, all right, verse 17. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Okay. So, let's tackle this caught up thing, right? Because I remember we, uh, who was in Guy Road? Anybody was at church in Guy Road? A few, okay. So, None of you seen, uh, nobody else saw the scene, but there was a woman there and she was a beautiful lady. She was super nice, but she came and she said, Devon, the word rapture isn't in the Bible. And you get that all the time. But the Greek word is harpazo, right? I'm maybe not saying that right, but you get the gist. And it means to be seized, to be snatched. And I wanna just let you guys know the path from that word to rapture there's a, a the rapture, the word we use, comes from the Latin, I mean, I, 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 say it again, raptus and rapil, right, two words, right, so the reason why you don't see it in the Bible is because our word is a second derivative of the original, does that make sense? So it kind of gets lost, doesn't matter, it means the same thing, right, so cool verses, what, what's really cool is that if you look at where the word is used, it almost always means to be snatched violently, right? So like if a soldier snatched the, uh, uh, the criminal, right? Or when they took, not the criminal, oof, the, the apostles. When they took the apostles, they harpazoed them, right? I'm conjugating in the English, but that's what happened. Um, but in other places, when Philip was caught up away from the Ethiopian eunuch, right? And he didn't see him anymore. 
same word, right? When Paul was caught up into the third heaven, right? Same word. So, um, and then Jude says, snatch them from the fires of hell. I'm paraphrasing, right? Same word. So, the idea that it's not in the Bible is just false. Matter of fact, almost half the time it's used in the Bible is used in the exact same sense as that what we're talking about now. So, a lot of people come up to you and say, well, this is the case, and you don't. Just read your Bible. Just read your Bible and you'll be safe. This picture of a rapture, the dead in Christ rising first, and then us meeting them in the air and meeting the Lord, it's more like a family reunion. When you say, it, you, you get, I mean, you've got the trumpet, you've got the voice of the archangel, the Lord is there protecting us. It is much different than what the second coming of the Lord looks like. And so we need to, we need to look at the contrast there because sometimes, um, I don't want to say commercialism, but like commercial Christian stuff, I don't know what that is really, but it kind of waters it down and puts everything on the same level so you can't really see what's the difference. So, but the Bible shows you the difference. So I would ask you to turn to Revelation chapter 19. Let's see if I can't get there. All right. Everybody there, man? Yeah. All right, so verse 11, it says, Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. So it's different stuff. And he who sat on the horse was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. I want you to, I'm pausing so you can understand the contrast. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one ex knew except himself. We're going to pause there because this is just a free point, right? This is Jesus coming back, and he has a name that nobody knows, right? They can't comprehend his name because he's that awesome, right? But we, so like the Old Testament saints, they, didn't, they had like Yahweh, but they, like they would say the Lord, right? We get to call him Jesus, right? Gabriel says call his name Jesus. So we assume like, all right, Jesus. Jesus is saying like, God is my savior, right? It's the equivalent of calling him daddy. You understand that? So when we see this name, it's like, why does Jesus have a different name? Well, it's because you call him dad when you say Jesus. That's why at the name of Jesus, every man will be saved, right? That's why there's salvation there because it's intimate, right? But he's coming back now and it's not so intimate for the people he's coming for. It's not the same. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. Verse 13. He was clothed with a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white, clean, followed him on white horses. This is Pastor Kevin's favorite part, right? This is the part where you, the scene where, like, he's, we got theme music and all of that jazz going on. He always talks about. So, in verse 14, it says, or verse 15 now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself, again, will rule with the iron rod. He himself treads the winepress of the furnace and the wrath of Almighty God. Okay? So that's a slightly different picture. Would, would you guys agree? Yes. It's humbling, right? That's, that's imposing. That is, not, that is not a party in the sky. That is not what that is. Right, that's something completely different. So don't merge the two as if they were the same. That would just be, that would just be bad teaching, in my opinion. Okay, so in summary, Thessalonians, we go up. In Revelations, we come back down. Right, those, his armies and the saints in fine linen, that's us. My fantasy, right, like the thing that I think about is that we all have, um, for lack of a better word, demons that mistreat us like in our life, right? And this is like my childhood thing, so like it may not make a whole lot of sense. But I just want you to get it. So like, like I have issues, like everybody else has issues. I am a sinner, right? L the Lord has saved me in spite of me, right? And so I know that there is probably not Satan himself, but maybe some minions that follow me around and make me have a bad day. I believe on this day, right, with our theme music, just like Pastor Kevin says, we're going to come back, and me and Chris have talked about this 
more than we should have. I believe when we come back, I will be my full-grown, real-life self, the way God intended me to do. And he's going to come back, and as he's speaking to the nations, he's going to say, Devon, that demon that made you do whatever that day, he's right over there. And I'm going to be able to see him, he's going to see me, and we're going to be able to have a one-on-one in my real-life spiritual body, and I'm going to mop the floor with him over and over again. That is like, I cannot wait to this day. I look forward to it so much, it's ridiculous, right? And what's cool is that you guys are going to be there with me. So like when we want a tag team, I'm going to just look at you and say, you ready? Right? And we'll be able to just enjoy ourselves in the Lord because we'll be invincible, and he, uh, he is who he is. And we're his kids. It's going to be awesome. All right. I lost my place. Hold on. Also, we are there. Oh, look back at, I hope you kept your, your finger in Thessalonians. It says, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. All right, that's the end of that, that verse. So you got to think, don't get caught in the day of the Lord. Rapture, we will always be with the Lord. Stay in Revelations. Stay in Revelations, okay? So this is just a fun thing that I like to do when I'm looking through Revelations to make sure that I don't even know. It's just, it's just cool to look at. So I want you to turn to Revelation. I'm sorry if I say Revelations. It's just a bad habit. I know. Turn to chapter uh, 3. Right? Because it says we will be with Jesus all the time. Right? We will always be with Jesus. So I would ask you from Revelations chapter 1 to Reve- like the beginning of Revelations chapter 4, do you see all the red? Like we're talking to the church, if you got red in your Bible, right? Then, verse 4, verse 1, it says, After these things, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here. And I will show you the things which must take place after this, right? And so as you work your way back to Revelation chapter 19, just turn your pages. Notice the lack of red. And I would ask you, where is Jesus during this time? He's not on earth. He's in heaven, right? He shows back up. In Revelations chapter 19, verse 11, right? Where he is reestablishing his kingdom and taking care of sin. So if you just, you don't even have to read your Bible. You could almost just look at the colors of the words and understand that God's going to take care of us, right? All right. Verse 18. Therefore, and I guess this is, verse 18 answers the reason why, why, why I do that. Right? I look at that in Revelations to understand that after he says, come up, I am with him. And though there's bombs going off down here, and you guys went through our Revelation study, understand that it's mayhem. I am sitting comfortable in the court of the Lord until I return with him and get to find my demons. And, 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 and I, I am comforted by that. All right, so... Let's look into, let's, let's, we got time. Let's go into chapter five. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. Okay? So one thing I just, again, just to drive the point home, I want you to realize that he's changing the subject. Right? We were talking about one thing, but now he wants to talk about specifically the times and the seasons. For you yourselves know perfectly or completely that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief of the night. How did they know that? Right? How do you know that the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night? Um, When I see this verse, it reminds me of Daniel um, chapter 9, verses, uh, we pick it up in verse 2. It says, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. So Daniel understood the timing 
like so when when so Daniel's in a time if you don't know where um, Babylonians are ruling and then there's a there's a change in regime from the Babylonians or Chaldeans to the Medo-Persian era all right and he understands what's going on and why because Daniel is always reading his Bible so I'm definitely not gonna stay sit here and say that you can know the day or the hour of the rapture but you can understand the season if you just stay close to your word and you see what's going on and you understand and what Daniel does next in Daniel chapter 9 verse 3 is one of the things that it should cause us to do it says then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplication with fasting sackcloth and ashes I would encourage you to read the rest of that but understanding the word and understanding where we are in our place in history should cause you to pray to fast but then to pray for others, right? To, to, to seek our family members out and to really, really want to be about the Lord's business because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been, been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And this is the verse, I'm, this is what I'm really trying to get to. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, right? So a couple of weeks ago, I was, this is before I even knew we were, we were going to be talking today. I was doing like this end time study. And man, it made me like go upstairs and like clean up the bathroom. I just wanted to do everything right. You know, I was like talking better, looking better, sharper, cut my hair, you know, just whatever I had to do. Because I said, I really, if the Lord comes right? I want to be ready. And I'm, I'm joking, but I, you, you understand what I mean? And we need to live with that all the time. We hear it all the time. And that's the problem. Like you got somebody like me telling you since you were like four that this is going to happen. So you really don't believe it's going to happen. Well, I'm telling you again, listen, you, you need to act like it could happen in the next five years. If I told you, say I, I was like the bad guy and I said, hey, I'm dating it. It's five years out. Bam. And you believe me, right? Would your life change? Who would you tell? Who would you go to to say, hey, man, we've got like five years left? Well, the Bible, we need to do that anyway. Like have that same sense of urgency so that we, could, we can pull these guys out of the fire, right? All right, um, where are we at? Verse 3. But when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. All right, so I got three things to talk about. Peace, safe, and then this, this escape here. So peace and safety, those are great words. Um, we use them all the time, and nobody knows like we know today that those words can be abused 100%. So um, let's talk about peace. Who doesn't want it, right? And think about these things. I wrote these things down, so I, I got to make sure. Look at your household. What do we do? to make sure we have peace in our household? What do we allow in our home just to make sure that our home is peaceful, right? Work environment. What do you overlook at work not to rustle any feathers, right? What comments are made about your Lord or about what we truly believe are made that we just kind of say, well, in, in, in the interest of peace, I'm gonna just, I'll just chill out. Look at the church. What do we put up with? Right? For unity, right? And peace. What don't we call out? Um, what did Jesus say? And uh, I think nothing's better than Matthew 10, 34. It says, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. <laughs> I did not come to bring peace, but the sword. Uh, I have here, in, in my own emphasis here is saying that when he says the sword, he's not saying actual violence. He is saying the word of God. And if you need to know about it, uh, Ephesians 6, 17 and Hebrews 4, uh, 12. For I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those in his own home. Right? So the word of God, that message, even to us, still will bring conflict. 
It's supposed to. It's supposed to make us uncomfortable. It's supposed to make us want to go and do something. It's not supposed to be peaceful because we're still attached to the flesh. Now, my favorite here is Isaiah 9, 6. So this is the Christmas. Year. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. And if you haven't looked at these, please go back and look at it. But we're going to land today on Prince of Peace. Now, um, this, I love this. I love it when I realized what this was, right? So this Prince of Peace, this is not like your um, like Snow White, uh, Sleeping Beauty, Prince, right? Like we, that's the idea because that's what, you know, that's, that's what we, or even, um, what's his name, Harry? Is that the Prince, like of England? Yeah, yeah, okay, all right, yeah, yeah, that guy. So it's not like that, not at all, right? So if you look at what this word means, it means Captain chief, general, governor, keeper, or the Lord. Um, slow down here, but it's the guy in charge of something, right? So if you look at like the Babylonians, if they wanted to do something, they would send their princes, right? He's not saying that he would send necessarily his sons, even though because they had so many wives, it could have been his sons. But in general, he's saying, I'm sending the guy in charge of this. And what I love about this, um, and then you have it, let me, I don't want to get ahead of myself. You have it also in like uh, the spiritual realm, right? So when, so when Daniel is talking, he's saying the prince of Greece, the prince of Persia. So those are, or, or I, Michael, your prince, right? So these are the guys in charge of either territories or whatever. The point is, peace is so difficult, God himself is saying, I'm gonna be in charge in that one. That's, is, that's gonna be my job, right? And I love that. Have you ever worked with somebody who was like excellent but had other people working for him? And it's always cool when that guy says, you know what, this is so important, I don't need any help, I'm gonna take care of it myself, right? And I love that about Jesus. Um, I always think of it as um, like, and here I've, I've got some bad examples, let's try one though. Um, Jordan, right, that last shot, you think anybody else is taking that shot, right? He's the best player in the game. He sent. It's so important, I'm going to do it myself. Um, if you watch the Super Bowl, which, right, the Rams, they needed a drive. Who they throw the ball to? Cooper Cup, right? Because he's the best, right? And then um, if you don't watch sports, uh, I like to think of it when, when handling a child, right? Uh, I look at my, my wife. When my daughters fall and the level of magnitude is higher than what they think daddy can stand, right, she swoops in and she says, don't worry about it. I'll do it myself. And I just love it that Jesus does it himself because he is peace. Right? He is peace. He's literally, peace comes from him. And that's why Galatians says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and what? Peace. So no Christ, no peace. You just can't do it. Right? So, but beware, the enemy... And I, this concept, it, like everything with the Bible, you got to watch for this, right? So you need to be like on guard, ready, because it's, it's always happening. The enemy always wants to trade that godly thing for something else that looks almost the same, right? So he wants to trade peace for things like apathy, right? Indifference, or just regular laziness or slothfulness, right? I'm being peaceful. I will do nothing, right? That's not it. Okay, safety. Uh, I just, so uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25, it says, and I had to just cut this down because for the sake of time, we're running out of time. For the Jews, from the Jews, this is Paul, Paul talking, five times I have received 40 stripes minus one, three times I've been beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, at night and day I've been in, in the deep, and there's like much, much more, if you want to read that section and, and, and know about it, but I, we're not called to be safe. There's nothing in the Bible that you see that says that we're supposed to, like we're actually supposed to live on the edge. I don't know what that is for you, but you need to find it and push it, right? Because Proverbs 18.10 says, the Lord is, our, is a strong tower, the righteous run to it and are saved, right? So we don't live our life to be safe. We run to the Lord as we're doing whatever he's called us to do, and he is our safety. It's a huge difference because right now they'll say, well, you'll do it because we make everybody safe and we'll never go outside again, right? You'll never do anything again. You will stay at home and be safe and peaceful and not do nothing for the Lord, 
And that is not what we're called to do. Read your Bible. So, all right. So beware. The enemy would like to trade safety for the same things. But instead, he wants to trade. It's like safety is a little bit different. It's a little bit different. It's not really a trade. It's like, hey, I want you to be safe because of this thing to be fearful of or because of this decision that will cause more conflict or because of I just want you to procrastinate and not do anything because if you don't do anything, nothing can happen, right? And that's not what we're called to do. All right. Uh, oh, here we go. It's escape. All right, this is the, the third thing. It says, and they shall not escape. So escape what? Well, Isaiah says this. It says, well, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as a destruction from the Almighty. Joel says this, alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. Amos says, woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness. Right? So, and that's just randomly. All I did was literally do a, a Bible search for the day of the Lord, and you get that same feel. The Old Testament prophets understood that this is not something that you... You guys ever seen a real fight? Right? If you've seen a real fight, like when you're kids, like everybody goes to the fight. But when you see like grown men fight, people go away. And I want you to understand that the day of the Lord, if you're not in Christ, if you're not in white linen behind him, you're going to want to crawl under something and pray. So it'll be too late. All right. But I smile because it says, and they will not escape. We are not they. There's a difference between the two of us, and the difference is Christ. So it says it will be darkness. Now we're going to take um, we're going to take verses uh, five through seven here, and just because for the sake of time, I'm going to read them, but we're not going to cover them because I, I want get, to get to verse eight. All right, but you brethren are in, are not in darkness, so that this day shall not overtake you as a thief. You are sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. Let us not watch and be, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. Now, we want to be in verse 8. It says, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. So, sober, I got, I'm going to just read the notes. It's a spoiler alert. It doesn't get better, right? The, the world gets better when Christ comes back. And so we have, as we see that day approaching, we have to be sober-minded, understanding that we have the breastplate. I mean, I want to, I want to, a faith and love. Right? So when you got the breastplate back then, you could walk around because nothing could get you. So even though we see it getting worse, we have to have that breastplate on understanding that, you know, I mean, World War III could happen tonight, literally right now. Yeah. Right? But we're okay because we have the breastplate of righteousness. Right? And then this, this last part gets confused so much that so we have to talk about, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. People get this confused as if I hope I am saved. That is not what this is saying, okay? So it's not like you had a bad day and now you're like, I hope I'm saved, I hope I get raptured, right? Maybe he's leaving me, like you watched Left Behind or something, you think you might be still left, left. That's not this, that's not what this is. This hope of salvation is like, we are hoping to see, that word salvation is rescue, right? So we are hoping, you should be hoping to be the generation that sees the rescue. That's all this is saying. We are to live like that, in order not to go crazy. That's why it's the helmet, right? Because if you didn't have the hope of being rescued for the Lord, if you didn't have a bad day and say, Lord, I'm going to keep it together because you might come back today, right? If you couldn't say that, what could you say? What would you be looking forward to? Okay. Verse 9, it says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus. So, he did not appoint us to wrath, Right, so that's Revelations 4 through 20. That's not for us. This is literally the gospel that Christ paid the price for us 
so that he took our wrath so that we would not have to take it. Does that make sense? All right, so uh, Romans 3.25, it says, whom God, speaking of Jesus, set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins which were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And I read you that to say, I can honestly stand up here and tell you guys, at the point where God begins to pour out his wrath on the earth, it is not biblical for us to be here. Because the price has already been paid for our sins at the cross. And no matter how bad it gets or what you do, you can always stand on that. Because his integrity, his credit is always good, even when ours suck. All right. Verse 10, it says, Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Jesus' ministry was one of reconciliation so that we could be with him. And he literally died. God died for you to not experience wrath, but also to be with him. Romans 5.10 says, for if when we were enemies, right? So when we were enemies to God, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. He killed his son or allowed his son to die when we were enemies. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So that's where the confidence in the rapture comes from, right? The man that would give his son, when we don't even like him, and you guys can pick where you were in your journey, Right? Now that you love him and, and worship him, how much more is he going to give for you? The last verse, it says, Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another. Build each other up, just as you also are doing. This comfort is twice. It's in there twice. It's not redundancy. He's saying, one, comfort each other that he is coming back for us. And praise the Lord that we do not have to experience his wrath. Right? So, last verse I'm going to read and then we're going we're gonna to pray and go is this is what I'll leave you with. This verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 10, it says, And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Amen? Amen. All right. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, thank you. Lord, thank you for being dad. Lord, thank you for covering us. Thank you for, for loving us, Lord. In spite of who we are and what this world may say, Lord, thank you for being consistent and faithful, Lord. Lord, and just thank you for being God and wanting to be with us, Lord, wanting to reconcile us, Lord. So, Lord, I lift up everybody today. I lift up the rest of this week. I lift up Pastor Kevin and, and his travels, Lord, and um, I pray that you would bless each and every one of us. Amen.